Hello Spooky Family and welcome back to a new episode of True Horrors. In this episode we talk about a case that's only a mere 40 years old and one that sends chills down my spine, especially in today's climate. That is the Jonestown mass murder-suicide. This may be a touchy subject for some of my viewers and if it is and you can't watch this one fully understand, go ahead and click away and tune in next week. Um, but for me, I think this is a very important case because it shows what happens when you go against your gut feeling. It shows what happens when you don't question your leader. It shows you the importance of being skeptic of your leader, whether you're a fan of them or not. It is gravely important. So. Let's get to it. On November 18th, 1978, approximately 900 souls died in Guyana, Jonestown. 300, about, roughly, were 17 and under. They were given flavoring laced with cyanide and Valium. I researched if this was like an instant death because if you listen to the death tape, which I'm not going to put in this video. If you like to hear it or you know, you're curious about it, a link to it is in the description. It's completely horrifying to listen to because you hear other people like pleading for children's lives and children were given poison in like syringes. It's, it's completely crazy. And maybe it's because I'm an empathetic person and I could kind of feel vibes, but every time I listen to it, I could just feel their fear. Um, but the death could take anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes. So the luckier ones only had to suffer for 5 minutes, and the not so lucky ones had to sit there and convulse and choke slowly for 20 minutes. It's crazy and cruel, and those that decided, oh hey, I don't want to do this, were either given a shot of the poison or shot. Now, let's get into Jim Jones. He was the leader of the People's Temple. He was charismatic, he looked like a creepy Elvis to me. He was very good with wordplay, being coming off as a humanitarian, opening up soup kitchens, helping the poor, fighting racism, allowing blacks and whites to come to his congregation together. He used religion and good deeds as a guise to hide the creepy man he was deep inside. You know, and some of those followers were true humanitarians, and I'm sure there were lovely people who really, you know, felt they were fighting a good cause, ending racism, um, feeding the poor, all that stuff. Good people. But they were manipulated by this man. And why? Because he was so charismatic. He was good with wordplay. And this is why I think that no matter leads you, you need to be skeptic of somebody that you are in favor of and somebody you're not in favor of. You need to trust your gut instincts. You need to take a moment and step away from this world that we have now. Full of all this false information flying around and people so easily grasping it. It's terrifying because could you imagine if Jim Jones had the internet right now? Would the numbers of casualties only be approximately 900 or would they be more? That's the kind of thoughts that go through my head when researching this. So he had really strict rules for his community 
And as the community grew, the weirder and creepier and more controlling the rules came on because once he knew he had people hooked, he made his followers give up all their belongings, all their like everything to the cause. Now these people thought they were fighting for a true cause, remember? They believed that their utopia would show the world that hey, you know, there can be a utopia on earth. So he could control and manipulate everybody. Because once they get to Guyana, okay, they don't have a home anymore in the States. So, you know, if you leave, you're going to be poor and broke and I can't help you because my healing aura doesn't reach you once you leave my church. That sort of thing. It was a power move. And a lot of times there were families, you know, families together. and. From the accounts of some of the interviews I watched from the survivors, they said, you know, they thought it was a good idea to get away from, you know, the tone that was going on in America at the time. So they go, and once they get there, all their belongings are going through. They have to surrender their passports, which would be a major red flag, and it was. It was for some people. And they found out that their little utopia was nothing more than a concentration camp. They had to work very hard. They had to, you know, there was very strict rules. You couldn't contact people outside of Jonestown. Um, it was like Jones didn't want people to know the truth. Now, Somehow word got out that there were people not happy in Jonestown and that they would like to leave. So a congressman and some reporters went down to investigate. And Jones had his people like recite all these good things about Jonestown. And, you know, obviously they were coached. Well, a survivor passed a note along and that got other people saying they wanted to leave too when the congressman was there. Jones is kind of getting panicky now. So he basically pretends to let these people leave. And just as they're about to leave, they were ambushed by gunmen. And the congressmen and reporters were casualties in this. And that is when he asked his townspeople to drink the flavor aid because the U.S. government was going to come and take their children and harm them and all of this sort of crazy. His main thing was preaching on the death tape, which is very, very hard to listen to. I don't know if I said this already, but if you want to listen to it, you can. I'll have the link in the description. I'm not going to put it in this video. I'm a very empathetic person, I go by vibes, even of stuff I listen to, and I can't imagine being in their shoes, or going through this. You hear a woman plead for the lives of children, you hear Jones talking about how like they must do a revolutionary suicide, that they have to do this, and frankly, you know, funnel, not frankly, funnily enough, he didn't take the flavor aid. He had a bullet wound to the head, so he made everybody else suffer. Uh, although, upon research, they did say they didn't know if it was a self-inflicted gun wound or not. I'm not sure. That's something that I may need to fact check. But, the death tape is excruciating. And I feel so bad for all those people that were fooled. I want to know your thoughts on this case. How do you feel about it? Did you know about it? Um, do you think it's something, a case in history? Remember, it's only 40 years old. Is this a case that we need to keep bringing up? So that way we can prevent it from happening again. I think the best weapon around, oh, the best weapon against something like another Jonestown is to have free thinking and to research 
and to question the world around you and to not take things as face value. That is the best weapon against this. I do hope you like this episode of True Horrors. I'm sorry for any background noise you have. If you hadn't noticed, I'm filming in a corner of my living room and it's like a big open space and everybody talks so loud when I want to record. <laughs> I hope you join me next time for another episode of True Horrors and give me a thumbs up. I'll see you guys later.